everyone can see the screen there, the first slide. Um, so my name is Stevie Donnelly. I'm from IT Sligo. Um, and I'm going to try take you through some slides now for the next 30 or 40 minutes. And then my colleague Mel Gavin is also going to run through a number of slides um, towards the end of the presentation. So just a little bit about ourselves first. Um, we're the IT Sligo Contract Research Unit and we're part of the research office of IT Sligo. And we work with a number of different stakeholders. We do work with Enterprise Ireland through innovation vouchers. We work with small and medium enterprises and obviously we're doing some work with um, Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. We're actually mentors for the border and west region. Um, so we have about 16 um, county mentors covering those counties. And then we're also doing um, some of these webinars for SAI also. OK, so conscious that um, you may already be on the SEC network or you might be considering joining or you might just be at the beginning stages of, um, of working out what your SEC might be about. Um, so SCI have identified these seven core competencies and they're basically the skills needed for community energy projects to succeed. Um, so just the seven of them there are in a graphic on the right hand side of your screen. And uh, the first one there is energy champion, or, or, or we also call that community engagement or partnerships and engagement. Then we've integrated planning, strategic financing, energy efficiency, renewable energy, sustainable transport, and then smart energy or sometimes what we call a smart grid. Okay, so today obviously we're going to talk about energy champion or community engagement. So some of the questions you might be asking yourself um, if you're interested in setting up an SEC and how you want to get um, people involved. So every SEC it's it's best practice to have a have a, a sort of a committee of members involved um, as well as the wider the wider community. So um, some of the questions you might ask is how do I get other stakeholders or committee members involved? Again, as I said, it depends what stage your SEC is at. Are you just starting out? Do you already have a steering committee established? And um, there might already be a steering committee of, of a sort through a community development association or a local sports club um, or, or a parish uh, council or something like that. So sometimes um, the structure already exists within a community and it's about uh, tweaking that structure to get to get some more members involved. So obviously you're looking to encourage as many people as is feasible to join so that the work doesn't fall on one or two people. And we've, we've definitely seen this myself and my colleague Mel have seen that uh, the work can fall on one or two people and then um, there's, there's too much to do and it can become um, overwhelming. So it is it is important to get as many people involved from the start. And again, the idea of those different skill sets um, if you can get an accountant involved, that's that's useful because obviously what it's all leading to is um, is that the community starts to do energy efficiency projects or renewable energy projects, and is um, is is getting grants from SEI and um, through their sustainable energy community. So it's good to have maybe an accountant involved, a community development association person involved, and um, people from local businesses, and then interested homeowners. Um, Again, your credit union managers, as I said, local businesses, sports clubs, your local school principal, and then what we call the first movers. These are the people that have been, I suppose, ranting on about energy efficiency for years, or they have the um, the passive homes, of highly insulated homes, and they're they're talking a lot about it in the community. They're living the benefits of it for a number of years. They're very good people to have the first hand experience of um, of um, how well their decisions have worked in terms of energy efficiency cost savings, the comfort of their home. So um, they're good to have on your on your um, committee. Again, if you're if you're looking to um, provide a bit of a carrot to these different people to include them in the committee, you can include their buildings in the energy master plan. So the energy master plan is what your SEC is striving to um, complete. And um, once your SEC is set up, you apply to SEI for some funding of between 10 and 25 grand. Um, and that money is to <clears throat> hire a an energy consultant to carry out an energy master plan, which um, a part of that energy master plan can can constitute some um, energy audits of homes or buildings. So that's one way of getting getting your, your local stakeholders involved by offering out that. And again, just the last point there, um, you can check the SEC network map and I have links to, to that at the end of the presentation. And you can reach out to similar size profile communities an example of that 
or two groups that we worked with um, in, in Dublin over the years. Um, so one of them is um, Knock Lion, which is based in South Dublin. So they're one of the mature SECs. Uh, they've done lots of different projects. They've done a lot of community engagement events and they're, they're a very active, very good um, SEC. And then one that's a little bit newer to the network, I suppose around the network about a year and a half now, is Port Marnock SEC. And they're based in North Dublin, so two different sides of Dublin City. But uh, Port Marnock made contact with Knock Lion and got an idea about how they set up their SEC and about the type of energy master plan that they went through. Okay, so that slide, the previous one. Just hearing a bit of noise there from someone on the line. Okay, I'll keep going. Um, so, so the first slide I went through there was about how you get people involved in your SEC committee. Then after that, you might be looking at, well, how do I involve the, the wider community? Um, so again, this can be very challenging um, for obvious reasons. So I'm just getting a bit of, I can hear an echo. So maybe does everyone have their, have their microphone on mute? Yeah, keep going. Yeah, I just checked with their CV. Everyone seems to be on mute. Sure, okay, maybe maybe it's an issue on my side. Um, I'll keep going anyway. Um, so yeah, some of the ways that we can get the wider community involved include um, using SEI leaflets and through your mentor or by directly contacting SEI. You can get leaflets dropped out for, for all the different types of energy efficiency measures and the different grants that are available and to get people thinking about um, what they'd like to do. You can hold public meetings um, and talk about what your SEC would like to do um, over the next year or next number of years and then how it will benefit the community. And in order to encourage people to come along to some of these events, sometimes you can offer free building energy ratings, which um, would come through your energy master plan that we discussed. Um, you can also hold an energy clinic or an energy workshop, again, with the help of SEI or your mentor. Um, ideas such as meet the expert, you, you might bring along someone who's been installing heat pumps or someone that installs um, different types of insulation to, to answer people's questions at an event. And then also something as simple as um, you can go through how to switch um, energy supplier using the website Bonkers and Switcher. And again, your, your mentor should be able to um, sit down with people in your community get their electricity bill out and talk to them about this is this is what you're paying for your electricity and your gas or your oil, um, and this is how you can switch your supplier. Um, you can use social media um, and advertise in local venues and newspapers. Again, you can advertise free be yours and um, to come along to an event. And then the obvious one, spreading the word to your friends and family. Um, and again, your mentor has worked with lots of different SECs over the last number of years. So ask them for advice. And one very well organized event was from Castle Blaney SEC back in uh, February 2017. And um, again, I have a link there to, um, to to what that event was about. They, they wouldn't mind being contacted to talk to them about how they went about organizing that event. They had all sorts of um, different suppliers of equipment and energy efficiency products there. And they had talks arranged at it and uh, it was really good. There was a really large number of people came along to that event. So um, there's, there are SECs out there that are, that are um, doing this really well in their communities. So just to give an example of, um, this is Sligo Environmental Network, and they obviously have kept track of all of the different events going on, um, just again in, in, in the locality of Sligo. Um, and you can see here the different bullet points go into all the events taking place, literally just in the space of one month. And they're all linked to environmentalism or energy or, or water or sustainability in some way. So it's important if you are running an SEC that you're aware of the other um, um, work that's going on out there in the community and, and, and see if you can make contact with those groups to see if they're interested in helping out with the SEC. Um, so just go through some of these. Um, you can see there on the 11th of September, there was um, a Green Party meeting on sustainable future and food diversification. Then on the 14th of September, the EC Street Festival, where they had a, an environmental corner. Then the 17th of September, um, Land Sligo. So that's an environmental initiative in its own right for communities and businesses. Again, on 20th of September, there was a the school strike. Um, there was also Culture Night, where you had the Sligo Climate Wisdom Project. Um, then there was also People for Profit, um, Eco-Socialist Workshop. 
um, Sligo Cathedral Parish had um, um, a religious event, uh, basically an invitation to talk about our planet. Um, then Extinction Rebellion had a seminar, I think that was online. Um, then the Public Participation Network, part of Sligo County Council, would have held a climate change event. And they would have got a good speaker at that, John Sweeney, from Professor John Sweeney from um, NUI Maynooth. And then there's a couple of other ones named there, um, one in Carrick and Shannon. So just to give you an idea, there are lots of different events going on in your locality that you should be aware of and try and make contacts. And it's it's um, get yourself on that list if you're organising an event, um, because people are looking out to to um, to do a little bit more, um, especially now in the current situation for the environment and and for energy. Just they're, they're having a bit more time to think about it. OK, so um, I'm just going to take you through a report that was commissioned by the um, Environmental Protection Agency of Ireland. Um, so it was completed by the Imagining 2050 team in University College Cork and the National Dialogue on Climate Action. So it was um, it's good because it was a 2019 workshop, so it's, it's quite recent and it goes through the, the different ways of community engagement um, and the, the National Dialogue on Climate Action. They recognise um, engagement as a continuum, uh, working from creating a general sense of awareness on a topic um, to engagement and right up to actually enabling and empowering citizens and, and communities to act and, and in that they mean carry out um, energy efficiency projects or renewable energy projects. So community participation has obviously gained um, increased attention in current climate change debates um, and policy strategies, um, both nationally and at international levels. So the cap there is the Climate Action Plan, which was released um, last July, um, so all, just less than a year ago. And then we also have the Renewable Electricity Support Scheme, which has some key elements and a key framework in place now for how um, large scale renewable energy generation projects um, have to have local participation and community participation for any for any um, development to be considered um, for support or funding from the government. So there's obviously an importance then of placing value on the role of intermediaries and partnerships and engaging communities, promoting peer-to-peer -peer networks and then facilitation of dialogue and transcending disciplines or specific groups. So this group, this um, this piece of um, this workshop funded by the EPA um, was set up to identify a number of determinants and conditions for community engagement in climate action. So the exercise they went through, they call it bridging the gap. Okay, so just a graphic here of a wooden bridge. The people on the left are asking questions. How are we supposed to engage with climate change? What can we do? What can I do from, on a personal level? What can I do as part of my community? How do I get people involved? And then on the far side, the right hand side, you have people that um, have managed to um, work through all of the different um, determinants here and come up with a successful community project. Um, so just starting on the left of the bridge there, we have visions then champions, drivers, tipping points, policy, research, communication, social practices and behaviour, supports, and finally finance. So I'm going to go through each of those. So within visions, obviously a key determinant for community engagement. So a vision allows for a clear understanding of the trajectory or destination in the climate transition. And it was um, it was recognised that there's a need to see the other side and understand where where the community is going, and how as a group or as a community the future can be reimagined. And the idea of shared visions comes about. And SCI have through the SEC network have a useful exercise in this through the community charter, and it's basically a one page um, document that just has some high level bullet points on it about what that community would like to achieve over the next number of years. And it's a useful document to bring along to different events and meetings and get members of the community to sign up. Number two, there are champions. Again, they're essential in encouraging community engagement. And again, we talked about these at the start. You have the pioneers or the first movers or the early adopters and champions, and they're critical for signaling and um, tipping points for change. And again, it's important that you have champions at different levels. So you might have champions within small businesses, such as shop owners. And then local citizens like like the people who have the, the passive houses or have, have installed some renewable energy systems on their homes. And a great example of that, um, and I'll talk about it a bit more later, is Saren Hermansen um, from Samso Island in Denmark. And um, they've done fantastic work over there 
and he's well worth um, looking into um, about how he engaged with his community and delivered um, a huge number of successful projects. Then we have drivers. So um, these can be social factors such as trust or justice, acceptance, perceptions of change and contingency planning. So the journey or the climate transition, as we sometimes call it, is dependent on people wanting to cross and being able to cross um, and not being forced to do so. Um, and then you're also looking at battling all thinking. So you want to involve people and not just the solutions, but also deciding what the problems are. And I think a good example of that can be electric vehicles. Um, they have gotten a lot of bad press over the last you know, five to ten years. Um, I think the, the common term that people have is range anxiety um, about, well, if I buy an electric vehicle, I won't be able to get anywhere. I, I break down in the middle of the road. A lot of those myths have been busted now because um, the range of the electric vehicles um, has increased substantially. Um, <clears throat> and obviously not everyone can afford a new electric vehicle, but the market is developing now. And um, even there's, there's new secondhand electric vehicles coming onto the market with, with better ranges than that. So it's, um, it's interesting to see one of the solutions out there can, can often take a battering in the, in the media for a long time, but in fact is a very viable solution for, for everyone getting out of their petrol and diesel vehicles. So then number four, tipping points. Um, change is oftentimes reactive and driven by urgency. So a crisis is more imminent for some people or communities and not for others with the consequence of delaying engagement and creating fractured responses to change. So we're, we're living through a tipping point at the moment, which is COVID-19. So hopefully we're going to come out of this with a, a more unified approach towards, um, towards the climate and, and, and putting in the right steps to, uh, for people to make the right decisions. Um, about making their homes and communities more energy efficient. Okay, so number five there, <clears throat> policy. Um, so some of the different issues that, that exist around policy are institutional issues such as policy silos. That, that could mean different government departments having different ideas of, of how to tackle climate action. Um, that seems to come under a little bit more control through the climate action plan which, which sets out specific criteria for each of the different government departments. Then also definitely we would have had disengaged policy makers over the years. Um, some of the other issues are policy approach issues such as balancing punitive measures with other supportive measures and clear leadership. So the punitive measures and um, the most obvious one there being talked about is the carbon tax that would be seen as a punitive measure um, and then obviously the supportive measures are, are something like the SEI um, grants that they'll give out for, for insulating your home or, or putting in heating controls or even installing some solar PV. So you have to get the balance of those right. Um, and then in terms of clear leadership, <clears throat> I would argue we still don't have clear leadership when it comes to this um, climate transition in Ireland. Um, obviously it's good now to have the climate action plan, but we don't have a, a formed government at the moment. So it's hard to clear, clear leadership when, when that's the case. And then finally on policy, just prioritization issues. Um, such as climate action prioritization and national dialogue and participation. And how, how do people rate climate action in terms of priority? You could argue that the priority at the moment now is going to be jobs and getting the economy back on track. That will have to be balanced or it should be balanced with um, our journey towards um, cleaner energy up to 2030. So number six, research. So again, the role of research in academia and acknowledging their common goals and acting more like a community. And by this we mean uh, strengthening the research impact and having a more engaged approach to research, not being behind a locked door in a, in a, in a lab carrying out research that's not um, really benefiting the community, but being more engaged with, in community problems. And um, speaking from an IT Sligo point of view, um, IT Sligo is trying to become a technological university with Letterkenny Institute of Technology and Galway Mayo Institute of Technology. And one of the key criteria there for, for making that happen is being becoming more engaged with the community um, and reaching out and um, using that research in a useful way for the different um, problems um, that exist within the community. The obvious one right now is COVID-19. And um, so I suspect there'll be a lot, a lot of research been carried out on, on the impacts of that and ways to come out of it successfully. So then number seven, communication. This is basically how the message is delivered and disseminated to communities. Um, so negative, scary and recriminatory or blaming messages are not useful and can be counterproductive. 
Instead, you have to have objective, consistent, supportive, and again, culturally sensitive messaging is more suitable. Number eight, um, social practices and behavior. So this talks about developing and expanding behavioral change strategies, such as energy consumption and mobility practices. And this is basically encouraging people to perhaps buy electric cars, take the bus, use the bike a bit more, um, turning down their, their temperature in their homes, getting the boiler service so that it's working better. All these different um, ideas. You have to be careful when you're um, encouraging your community to do these things, um, what they call nudge strategies. So sometimes it can be perceived that they're overlooking the structurally and socially constrained manner in which social behavior and practices are embedded, such as wider societal issues. And a clear example of that is, um, you know, tackling um, transport energy with uh, carbon tax. And some people, especially in rural Ireland, don't have much of a choice when it comes to um, changing their mode of transport. They might not be able to afford an electric vehicle. There might not be a bus service. It might be too dangerous to cycle. So really, um, they're being penalised in a way um, by, by having a carbon tax pl placed on them versus someone who lives in the city who can easily transfer to a bus or, or get a bike. OK, and then just the last two in this bridging the gap exercise, which was carried out. Um, so obviously the supports are valuable determinants in generating community engagement with climate action. Um, and this can include awareness or knowledge transfer. So that's basically what, what, what's happening today and, and what you and your SECs will be uh, providing to your communities and um, using the appropriate language, the technical skills. And um, again, that's what today is about. Um, SEI can provide technical skills through the different frameworks they have for helping communities. Um, education at an early stage, that's basically um, the schools program that SEI runs, as well as a number of other entities in Ireland running different uh, or similar programs. And then needs-based and tailored supports, experts-based supports, and then safety nets. And what we mean by safety nets is if you get a group of homeowners um, deciding to invest in um, energy efficiency through, through different contractors, and um, what's their safety net? How are they protected from the investment that they're making? Um, and sometimes this can be covered off by the actual requirements of the grant that they're applying for. That's just one example of a safety net. Um, and then finally, the finance, the all-important finance. Um, so in terms of finance and engaging with the community for climate action, we're constantly in search for new business models and ways of innovating how finance can be provided. The new climate action plan talks about green mortgages. Um, it's not very clear how exactly that's going to look. There's plenty of other models that have worked well and not so well in other European countries. So hopefully we'll have something like that um, sooner rather than later. Again, how the resources are managed, reskilling and training, rebranding, new opportunities, and um, the incentives, and um, the ability to access funds um, through so, such entities as Clan Credo or Community Finance Ireland. Um, insurance is a key is a key element. And then approved efficiencies in, in how um, individual households or individual businesses can access funding um, as a group or as a community through perhaps their local credit union um, at, um, at better rates than if they went individually. So that's the exercise of um, bridging the gap. And it's, it's interesting just to see the different um, elements when it comes to understanding community engagement. And it can be difficult when you are engaging with the community to people can tackle you with different and difficult questions about their version of what should happen or what shouldn't happen or whose fault it is or isn't. So it's, so it's important to be mindful of the different elements um, or different uh, key determinants when it comes to community engagement. This is just an example here from the Community Energy Hub, which is based in England. Um, and it just gives some examples. It's a good website and there's a link at the end of the presentation to the to their website. And um, if you're interested in developing a renewable energy project within your community, it's well worth a look. So they just got have some examples of these high level statements that you can have perhaps in your community charter. And um, so a starting point um, to decide what you want to achieve from a project. So it could be as simple as the aim of this project is to develop a community owned solar PV installation on a community building part ownership of the installation by local community group. So again, good, simple language. So the next step would be to establish how and why you want to engage with community, and what outcomes you expect from the engagement plan. And again, simply put, the aim of the community engagement project is to raise awareness of the project and collect feedback from the community on the plans. 
So they're just some simple examples. It could be any type of renewable energy or energy efficiency project, but it's important to be clear about what you're attempting to do. Seek that feedback from the community um, and give them the opportunity to um, to feedback. And just at the bottom of that slide, there's a there's a very good paper on um, it was a review of the evolution of community energy business models for solar PV systems. Um, it's worth a read if you're interested in solar PV um, and community community projects. So again, just some of the different stakeholders. These might seem very obvious, um, but again, um, it's worth going through just to make sure they're covered off um, for your SEC. So just starting on the left there with number one, um, your energy or environmental champion, that, that could be you if you're on this call and you're, you're, you're leading up your SEC. Um, you might have um, religious groups involved or community development um, association groups, your neighbours, your friends or families, or that could be um, housing associations within your area and um, you could have a project manager. Your local authorities are key and local authorities now do have a mandate uh, to be more engaged with their communities through the Climate Action Plan, so, so do make contact with them. Um, your first and second level educators, that's your that's your primary and secondary schools. Your higher education institutes, again, I talked about IT Sligo, similar for all of the third level providers um, in Ireland, they're, they're, all, they're all engaged in, in some form of energy research or, or um, um, some of them are SECs in their own right, so um, definitely um, if you have links in there, do get in contact with them. And then further education providers, your, your education and training boards, who again are linked to your local authorities. Uh, number 10 there on the right hand side, your exemplar or model communities. Again, there's a couple of examples of these. Um, um, there's, there's lots of examples of these, I, I go through some of those um, in a couple of slides. Your business actors, so this could be your um, large businesses in your, in your locality. Um, your networks and business networks, such as uh, your Chamber of Commerce. Uh, bridging organisations, we spoke about Community Finance Ireland and Clan Credo. There are others out there. Uh, your government agencies, such as SAI or the EPA, and there's a number of other ones. And then European or global actors, um, the use of social media, and then your skill facilitators. So again, you're trying to gain an understanding of how each of these groups might affect um, your idea for a project or, or a suite of projects um, and consider having a tailored approach about how you approach those communities, sorry, those stakeholders to talk about your project and how they'd like to take part, if they want to take part at all. So again, this just fleshes out some of what we talked about on the first couple of slides, um, the good and bad about using different methods of engagement and communication. So obviously local TV and radio campaigns, you're obviously likely to reach a large number of people very quickly using this, but again, there's a cost associated with this and whether your SEC has um, the ability to fund that has to be considered. Um, leafleting and flyers, you can directly target these at, at homes to ensure that people in specific areas can receive relevant information. Then you might have some newsletters. Um, I've seen these work well with different communities and um, they're, they're either monthly or bi-monthly or quarterly. And uh, again, if you can get people's email addresses, and I know we all have to be conscious of GDPR these days, but if you can get people's email addresses, it's really useful and um, you can keep them updated on the progress of the SEC or indeed the progress of, of any environmental or energy related um, project that's going on in your locality. And then community surveys. Um, my colleague Mel has used these quite well in different communities through Google Forms. It's uh, basically a free, free service or survey monkey. You can just use it, send it out, ask people what they think, um, what would the community like to get behind. Um, in, and by using these, you're gauging the needs and views of a large number of people in the community. So again, it's good for obtaining quantitative data and encouraging people to engage with the project. Public meetings um, are, can be very good. Um, they can have robust um, conversations. Um, it enables a large number of people to have their say and provides an open forum for people to receive information and gather in return. These can be key um, in developing a project um, and it can take time to develop these projects when, you're, when you take a number of individual homeowners or, or businesses. Um, it can take up to a year to get, to get organised and, and fit into the different grant timelines that are available. And having meetings um, at the start, maybe in the middle, um, can demonstrate that a project is taken into account people's views um, and enables participants to develop networks and discuss ideas with other members of the community. Uh, then community mapping, um, again, my colleague Mel has developed um, 
an exercise that it goes through that we go through with our SECs. Um, you know, we, we, we look at some CSO data for, for localities and we put up some maps of the area to show people um, what the area looks like, where the different housing associations, associations are, sorry, the, the housing estates are, um, how much energy is used by an average house and how much money, I suppose, in transport fuel and um, electricity and gas and oil is, is leaving that community every day. And it can be a real eye opener and really useful um, in engaging communities. Then obviously you have your web-based engagement and that's your social media and web-based engagement. And again, it's probably a good idea if you're putting a committee together for your SEC to get someone who's who's um, well versed in, in this type of uh, marketing or social media, good at designing a website, those types of skills. It's really, really good to get someone like that involved. Again, it's cost effective to have a to have your own website and you can put up your, your news feed there. You can get people to sign up to a newsletter and uh, it can be, be very useful. OK, so last year at the SEC national event, so it was last year or the year before, um, Mulrani SEC, um, a woman called Carol Loftus gave a fantastic presentation about Mulrani, which is based in Mayo. It's a small, uh, small town or village in Mayo. And they have a really engaged community there. Um, and this is an example of how they sort of, they'd already sort of carried out a stakeholder um, mapping exercise. They have, they have this project called the Mulrani Community Futures. And you can see there in the image, the, the different sort of, um, Entities or groups that they'd identified in the town. You did the tidy towns, tourism, the graveyard committee, the school board, um, the industrial trust, even the pipe band, and uh, the football club, um, the peer club, uh, the golf club. Um, one here, the old Irish Gold Society, which is very interesting, um, and I would check it out. Um, and then they had a green plan. So you can see they developed different um, types of projects that then eventually led to um, them finding the Sustainable Energy Community Network and saying we can actually use this network, we can set up a group, use some of our committee members that already exist, um, apply for funding from SEI um, and then carry out an energy master plan and they've also managed to carry out some really useful um, exercises, just those bullet points on the right hand side. They had a green schools initiative, a bulb exchange and a BEO or a workshop and again, they managed to get some funding from SEI to do this. Um, now it's not something that SEI just willy-nilly will fund if you ask them to, 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 to do it. But in this case, they did because Mulrani were, they were at the table first and said, we, we have an idea to engage the community. Um, and it coincided with, I suppose, how SEI are viewing um, the different behavioral strategies uh, for engaging community. So um, just the BER workshop was useful. They invited everyone to come along to um, the event with a BER if they had one. And at the event, they had a number of um, experts in the room to, I suppose, talk about the person's BER and say, well, because the BER is useful to a point, it doesn't go into detail about how much each of the energy efficiency measures cost. Um, so it's good to, to bring it to um, an expert who can talk you through it, talk through some of the prices and tell you what's, what's the best um, uh, use of your money, I suppose, uh, depending on what your budget is. Okay, so that's just a good example of uh, Mulrani SEC. And again, um, further away from home, um, I mentioned um, in Denmark, there's Samso Island. Um, the chap on the top left of the picture there is Soren Hermansen. He actually spoke at the SEC event last year and uh, gave a very good presentation. I think the slides are available here. They're not as useful unless he's actually presenting them. Um, so if you, if you can find some um, um, presentations of them online, um, it's well worth a watch. And just this image here is great. There are just a number of um, islanders and they're just members of the community and they've been taken through the whole process of uh, community engagement right through to a project idea that definitely didn't happen overnight. Uh, this would have been years in the making and you can see here this, this number of people all have shares in what they're standing beside there is the base of a wind turbine. So um, they're, they're really leading the way there in how communities can get involved in um, large scale renewable energy projects. So a um, very, very good um, energy champion there um, in terms of engaging his community. And then again, closer to home, um, a good example is the Drumbane Upper Church Energy Team. So just take you through these couple of points here. 
and uh, Drumbane is in Tipperary. Um, so during the recession, like a lot of places, emigration had hit Drumbane, Upper Church, very hard. And a lot of the local GA players um, had left, obviously, because there was no jobs anymore in the local area or the local towns and that. Um, so they had a motivation in this town. They needed to create local jobs and try and reverse that immigration trend. So they came upon the idea of um, local home retrofits. So um, as mentioned, a lot of people have um, oil and gas um, to, to heat their homes. So that's money basically leaving the economy um, day in, day out. So they came upon this idea and said, well, if we reduce the amount of energy going out and um, the amount of money being spent on energy in homes and businesses, um, that'll save money in the economy. And we can also employ people in the local economy to carry out the work required and um, to insulate homes better so that we're not using as much oil and gas. So that entity now that was set up um, does retrofitting nationwide. And it's a very successful model for, for how a community sort of um, took things into their own hands. Um, so just point five there, um, citizens have taken a more constructive approach by seeking to develop technological and social solutions to their local circumstances and the problems that concern them. And um, there's a good um, case study about um, this project through um, Vincent Carraher, who works in Trinity. And there's a link there to the bottom of it. He, he ran a project called Spark Change. OK, and then there are the references basically for everything I've gone through there. Um, just two, two more uh, points that I won't go through in detail, but they are very useful um, insights. Um, the first one there is um, an SCI document, Behavioural Insights on Energy Efficiency in the Residential Sector, and then Changing Energy Behaviour and What Works. So SCI put a lot of time and effort into these documents. If, if you're in your SEC and trying to figure out how do I talk the language that people will understand, because um, most people are interested in um, their own individual energy requirements, saving money in their own home, making their own home less drafty, installing solar panels on their own roof. So it's useful to um, understand the decisions that people make um, and why they make them and how they make them um, while you're talking to them. Um, so if you can understand those a bit better, then you can talk to people um, in a better way about a community approach to energy projects. So again, two very useful documents. So that's it from me. I'm now going to ask my colleague Mel to Share his screen. Mel, are you there? Yep, yeah, yeah, I'm there. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing now. Okay, I'm just trying to share the screen. What are you seeing at the moment, Stevie? Uh, I can just see. <clears throat> can just see. Um, it's not on. It's not on slideshow. It's just um, the normal. If you as if you were editing your your um, PowerPoint. But you can't see can't it. See. Okay. Yeah, I can see it now, but just not on slideshow. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's on slideshow now. I'll go ahead. Sorry, sorry, sorry about sorry. that little technical glitch there. Um, and first of all, um, thanks for joining us. And also, apologies to anyone who may have seen this story before on last week's renewable heat seminar or webinar. It was intended as a, as an example of how not to do community engagement. So it's more relative to, to the community engagement webinar. So I'll, I'll just kick off. It'll only take about five minutes. So it's a short story about good intentions and poor outcomes. It starts off with the Northern Ireland Renewable Heat Incentive, um, which was, uh, was designed with good intentions. And the purpose of that was to provide an incentive to use wood fuels instead of oil and gas and to that effect it did work as we know now the um there weren't enough controls or limits or the controls or limits weren't um specific enough to avoid people just simply burning fuel for fun wood fuel for fun and the heat leaving the, the, the building or the facility without being of any use so it became known as we know as cash for ash because of our wonderful tabloid press are very good at come up coming up with a catchy headline 
and it also spurned images like this and even this book by um, Sam McBride. And poor old Arlene Foster there is shown, you know, smiling as Stormont burns behind her. And I'm pretty sure she wasn't at all happy about the, the overall thing. So this isn't the first time that um, a scheme like this has been designed and been abused. And it may or may not be because of a poor understanding of the community. But the next um, example of this, I have, I have to go back a little bit back in history to another British administration. And I'm not really picking on the Brits here. I was born in England myself. I spent a lot of time there, including schooling and, and work. Um, it just so happens that this version of this story uh, lends itself, although there are plenty of other administrations that have done made similar mistakes. So this is the, the, the Indian country, as it were, as part of the British Empire. It obviously takes up a, a lot more space than it does now because it's now India, Pakistan, Bangladesh and various other places. But it was ruled by Britain as part of the empire between the middle of the 19th century and the middle of the 20th century, although they had been involved in, in, in that area of the continent through trade and trade and exploration for, for a number of years before that, a number of centuries even. Um, now, in India, you have a natural environment for snakes, and in particular cobras. Um, and in a, in a large city like Delhi at the time, um, which is still obviously a large city, large population at the time, you had this large human population Therefore, lots of waste, lots of insects, lots of rodents made it even even better for the cobras. So this was a, a natural environment where they could thrive. And to the Indians, they were sort of a regular occurrence. They weren't all that bothered by them. Yes, people did get bitten and sometimes people would die, but it wasn't all that unusual for the Indians. They were used to them. For the British authorities, on the other hand, many whom would have just wanted a sunnier version of London, these were, they weren't a pigeon, they weren't a rat, so they were quite a non-British vermin and they wanted to get rid of them. So the governor at the time, the governor of Delhi or governor of India at the time, decided to provide an incentive to the community to get rid of the cobras and he offered a bounty. So the cobra bounty was essentially that if you killed a cobra and brought it into a local police station, you would be given some cash. I don't know how much it was. But it was enough to incentivize the, the local community to go out and start hunting cobras and killing them and bringing them in. And there are some anecdotes here where some, some of the Indians would take advantage of, of a new recruit to a police station and they would bring in a cobra skin. And the poor new recruit, probably just arrived from Britain, would offer out the bounty, uh, not having learned yet that cobra shed their skin. And this wasn't uh, a dead cobra or wasn't even proof of a dead cobra. Now, eventually, the Indians got a little tired, and this was a nice um, money stream for them. But they got a little tired of running around and hunting the cobras, so they did what anyone sensible would do, and they started to farm the cobras. So they got themselves a, a daddy snake and a mammy snake and a, put on some Barry White and let nature take its course. And, of course, <laughs> this meant that the wild cobra population simply thrived again, and the, the British authorities eventually saw this and they figured out what was going on and they did what most authorities would do in that situation and they, they cut the bounty. So the bounty ended and this meant that there was no need for the Indians to leave Barry White on and keep on all these farmed snakes in their homes and in their spare rooms and in their, their backyards. So they let them go and then you had the largest infestation of cobras ever in Delhi. This whole episode, this whole affair became known as the the cobra effect, which is a term now accepted to, to refer to good intentions and un, unintended consequences. But if we had the tabloid press from today, go back in time and choose, uh, choose a new name, they would probably come up with cash for asps. That's the end of my story. Thank you. That was uh, brilliant, Mel. Thanks so much. Uh, I don't see any questions on the side, but if anyone wants to type some in, um, go for it. Give them a few secs. No, there doesn't seem to be anything there. 
Um, Stevie, Mel, thanks so much. That was brilliant. And thanks for everyone who joined. I hope you found that really useful and beneficial. Um, and I will speak to you all soon. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.